Hi everyone. So today we're going to talk about some applications of Newton's law of gravitation. So first is that this law affects ocean tides. So if you don't know what tides are, tides are the rise and fall of the sea level on Earth. So one of the causes of tides, so there are others, but the main factor of high and low tides is the gravitational attraction of the Earth and the Moon. So basically, um, the water on the surface of the Earth is attracted to the Moon. Right? So see, if you see here on this diagram to the right, we have the Moon and the Earth, and we have a tidal bulge in the area um, near the closest to the Moon, you see right next to the, the arrows, but we also have a tidal bulge on the other side. Um, so the tidal bulge on the side closest to the Moon is due to the gravitational attraction of the Moon. The other bulge is due to the um, inertia of the water. So to counteract and kind of counterbalances the, the pull of the force of gravity of the Moon. Another application is the Cavendish experiment. So Cavendish was a physicist who was a, a pretty strange guy. Um, he was pretty much a loner. Um, even with dealing with his actually his maids, he didn't want to interact with his maids. He actually built uh, a separate staircase in the back of his house for the maids to travel, so he didn't have to see them in person. It's pretty strange. Um, but he actually worked on an experiment that he adapted from um, a geologist named John Mitchell, who uh, was designing this experiment, but unfortunately passed away before he was able to use this idea of a torsion balance to measure the Earth's density. So a lot of this mechanism was already built, actually, and they were shipped, all this experiment was shipped over to Cavendish for him to see if Cavendish could measure the Earth's density. Well, as a side effect of this experiment um, was actually that Cavendish was able to measure the gravitational constant g to a very large precision. Um, so remember, g is equal to 6.6 seven times 10 to the negative 11 newtons times meters squared per kilogram squared. Well, there's actually a lot more decimals than just the 6.67, um, and Cavendish was able to accurately measure this. Um, so he did this by setting up what's called a torsion balance. The details of this are not necessary for you to understand or to know, but basically he set up a balance in which the gravitational attraction between two masses, in this case two balls, one was more massive than the other. Um, he dealt with how much they um, were able to move based on the gravitational attraction. Um, in order to do this measurement, actually he had to be pretty far away from the experiment. He actually measured, did all of his measurements with a telescope from far away. Pretty interesting. Another concept with the gravitational force is that it's a field force. So remember we talked about gravity being an action at a distance force. The objects don't actually have to be touching to feel the gravitational force, right? You have the same thing going on with the electrical force, also a field force. Um, so like we did with electricity, we developed an idea called a field, right? And what fields do um, is they're basically a theory that is used to explain how non-contact forces operate. So the gravitational force is a field force, which basically means that any object that has mass has a gravitational field surrounding. The more massive the object is, the stronger this gravitational field is around it, which means we have a stronger gravitational force. Right? So actually, this formula here at the bottom right, um, I don't know why I posted it there, but I did, G is actually the gravitational field. Um, it's equal to the gravitational force divided by whatever mass is um, in that field, interacting with the field. So remember how with gravitation, uh, excuse me, not gravitational, with electrical force, electrical force was, um, we're talking about electric field, the electric field strength was equal to the, the force divided by the test charge. This is basically the same thing. Same thing. The gravitational field strength is equal to the gravitational force divided by a test mass in this case. So whatever mass we're observing, what gravitational force it feels, or whatever the gravitational field it feels at that location is determined by the gravitational force at that location. 
um, don't worry about that big g times n divided by r squared right now. So this gravitational field is a vector field, um, and it has a magnitude of little g, right? Remember, little g is 9.8 meters per second squared on Earth. Um, this vector field is pointing towards the Earth because the force that any object feels above the surface of the Earth is going to be pointing, it's going to be attracted towards the center of the Earth. So our gravitational field is pointing towards the center of the Earth. And on Earth, it's 9.8, again, 9.8 meters per second squared towards the center of the Earth. Um, on other planets, it have a different value depending on the mass of the planet. Actually, that's what the previous formula on the previous slide said. It's big G times whatever the mass of the planet is, or the object creating this gravitational field, divided by the distance squared away from our test mass or test object. All right, moving on from that. Force of gravity also affects our weight. So as we discussed when we dealt with forces, our weight is equal to m times g. So the magnitude of the force times, um, excuse me, it's the magnitude of the force of gravity, which we discussed being our mass times the acceleration due to gravity. So our weight depends on g, this little g, right? This um, gravitational field strength. And so depending on the location you are um, away from the object depends on, it changes the mass, excuse me. So looking at these formulas here, I just want to show how we can derive that formula I showed a little while back, right? So say if you look here at the bottom left, we have the force of gravity is equal to m times little g, right? Mass times the acceleration to gravity, the gravitational field strength, right? They're, they're the same thing. We can rearrange that, solving for the gravitational field strength. So g is equal to a gravitational force divided by math, mass. And then we can plug in our generalized form for the force of gravity. So here we're looking specifically at mass of the Earth, the earth and the test mass. So let's say we have a pencil we're dropping towards the Earth, right? So here in this expression on the top, we have big G, gravitational constant multiplied by the mass of the Earth, multiplied by the mass of our pencil, our test object, divided by the distance between the Earth and the pencil squared. Right? So we plug that into our formula, we plug that in for our force of gravity, and we see that the mass of our test object cancels out. So actually our gravitational field strength does not depend on the mass of our test object, the mass of our pencil. If you're trying to figure out what, um, if you're using your, your own body in this example, it does not matter what your mass is to determine what the gravitational field strength is, which makes sense. The gravitational field strength due to the Earth should not depend on the mass of the object you're dealing with. Anyway, simplify the math, you find out that the expression for g, the acceleration due to gravity, or the gravitational field strength, is equal to your um, big G, the gravitational constant, multiplied by the mass of the Earth, or in this case, the mass of the object that's producing the electric field, divided by the distance squared. That's the distance between the center of the Earth and the center of mass of your test object. This expression can be adapted to um, whatever material you're dealing with the gravitational field strength for. So here, if we were to actually plug in the values for the Earth, so here the mass of the Earth and say R squared being um, the surface of the Earth, so the radius of the Earth, so the distance between the center of the Earth and the top of the Earth's crust. I don't remember what that number is off the top of my head, but you can look it up in any physics textbook or online. If you plug in those numbers, that's how you get 9.8 meters per second squared. Plug in the mass of the Earth and you plug in the radius of the Earth. And so that gives you the strength of the electric, or just the strength of the gravitational field on the surface of the Earth. So you can do this with other planets as well. Instead of mass, so instead of Earth, you can put in the mass of, say, we're dealing with the moon, not a planet, but still a celestial body. We can do it. plug in the mass of the moon, the radius of the moon, and you can find the gravitational field strength on the surface of the moon. And you can actually do this with any object. You can do it with your cell phone. You plug in the mass of the cell phone, and even though 
doesn't really have a radius. When you can zoom it, your phone is spherical to the radius of your phone, and you can see what the gravitational field is at the surface of your phone, right? Or you can say gravitational field strength of your phone at a distance away at you. Just the distance between your phone and you, you can plug that in for R, and that's the gravitational field. It's going to be really, 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 really small, at least compared to the gravitational field strength of the Earth, but it'll still have some numerical value. And finally, I want to talk about mass. So there used to be two, well, there are two definitions of mass, right? First is inertial mass, and that's the mass that's defined by Newton's second law, right? Newton's second law being F equals ma. So this mass basically refers to the property of an object to resist acceleration. We also have a definition of mass in terms of gravity. This is gravitational mass. This is the mass that's in Newton's gravitation equation. So this mass basically relates on how objects attract one another. It was debated for a while in physics if there are two different definitions of mass. But it's generally accepted that these are actually the same mass. The reason why is because all the data doesn't show that they're any different. They behave in the same way. So they're the same mass. So a simple example is that they're, they, these two masses are equal because the acceleration of the objects in free fall on Earth surface is always the same, right? If they were different, this wouldn't be true. So this mass is generally accepted as being the same mass definition. Yeah, and that's all I have for you guys. So hopefully that was helpful.